united with Christ. Meet local churches with open doors serving throughout the Border Valley community and sharing the truth and hope of God's love and salvation. A presentation by KSCE Channel 38 Christian Television. And now, United with Christ. Good morning. My name is Dr. Kevin McCarthy. I want to welcome you to United in Christ. I would also like to thank the staff and the management of KSCE TV for allowing us to come into your homes and your offices today. Today's show explores a topic that plagues every life, and that is the choice between good and evil. It's very easy to identify and spot behaviors that we could term evil in the lives of others, classify them, and remove ourselves from contact with those people. But it's a very difficult process to introspect and look at our own behaviors and to understand how we not only embrace the influence of Satan as an entity, as a person, as an individual, but the forces of evil that are rampant in our society. As a retired clinical psychologist, I've devoted my interest to studying evil in human behavior and how choices are made. And it seems to me that as children, we incur an infection, a spiritual infection, by virtue of behaviors and choices that we make. And that as time goes by, we become inoculated to the effects of evil in our lives. And we come to accept certain behaviors as normative rather than challenging us internally to change our behaviors. We look around us and we see what other people are doing and we make the decision that what we're doing is acceptable because other people are doing it. So I challenge you today to be willing to look inside yourself and to consider what choices have you made historically and where are you now in the gulf between good and evil. I've asked Dr. Rick Wadge to join me today. Um, Dr. Wadge is a pastor and theologian and I've asked him to explore this concept of good versus evil from a biblical framework. Because the one constant that we can lean on is God's word. Rick, I want to welcome you to uh, United in Christ. Dr. McCarthy, good to see you again. I'll call you Kevin for the Please. show. Please. Please. Uh, it's, it's always good to talk about that which is the most relevant for us in our own personal lives, for growth, mm. but also I think in how it impacts the society around us. As you are well aware of, we live in a world that is challenged by dealing with this issue of evil. Uh, and it's very core in its foundation. We see that it affects all parts of our lives. Uh, we're encircled mm -hmm. with uh, not only the inclination toward evil within ourselves, but also within the inclination of others and how we interact with them. So exactly. it's essential. It's essential that we deal with this issue. And the response can't be a passive response. As we were talking before the show began, we're called biblically and spiritually as Christians to have an active response to the influence of evil in our lives. Yes, uh, to dispel it. Yes. To be the light yes. that uh, dispels the darkness in the room. And the room that we have to deal with is not just the room uh, which we all dwell within when we close our eyes, but the room in this world that we're all dealing with as we live together in cooperation and community. 
But what you're suggesting is living in a way that's counterculture. And so you're going to engender a certain amount of resistance and hostility from the culture that you live in. Which is, which is very true and interesting because it goes counter to the society we find within Scripture. Scripture is theocentric. It's where God is the very center of things and how we respond mm -hmm. and react uh, within our society is directly related to how we've understood the God in our lives and the God in our society. That is not the case in Western 21st century society in the world. We're finding that God is on the outside of much of what we talk about and we do. How can we as Christians embrace the contradiction of professing a relationship with God in our lives, but then isolating him to Sunday as we go out through our day and we encounter the influences of the culture on our lives. Well, that's a very Western mindset that God is a, uh, a part of our life, but he's isolated to boundaries. And so we allow him in for a Wednesday night Bible study. We think about him on Sunday morning as we're hearing the preacher preach. But how that impacts the rest of our lives is a very Western idea where we've isolated our religious beliefs to a segment of our lives, not the entire totality of our lives. Now, it seems to me that the very issue that we're talking about took place in Eden. The very issue we're talking about, that the serpent tempted Eve. This is the first sign we have of evil in the Bible, the presence of evil. And instead of crying out and asking God, testing what the serpent told her, she just folded to the lie. Mm -hmm. And then it was speedily followed by Adam's disobedience, mm -hmm. and then it catapulted to the world's first murder. Yes. So we know something about the way that evil transforms people, and we know that our behaviors today, as we live today in our culture, is not dissimilar from Adam and Eve. Somehow, they lack that ability to turn back to their creator and seek him before they did anything. That's interesting that you, you bring that up. Um, uh, not, the, not the idea of the first sin or falling away and then the global impact of that. Uh, that makes sense, but the, but the concept of whether or not they actually went back, we don't actually know that in scripture. And that's very interesting uh, that you bring that up. We do see the effects of their mindset of, of saying that when they ate from the, I'll use the term, the tree of decision making, if right. you will, because we've right. been making decisions ever since. Right. Whether to follow, walk away, do our own thing, mm -hmm. uh, has direct, a direct effect on their, on their children. Immediate, as exactly. you brought up. Cain and Abel. Exactly. What a great example. And within that story, within Genesis chapter 4, we find some huge implications, this imagery of this uh, crouching beast outside of the door of his inclination of whether right. Cain will, will follow after God, make the right decisions, or follow after this beastly inclination to continue doing his own thing. As a psychologist, as a retired psychologist, what captures my attention is that the first sin is talked about in the Bible is a lie. It's something as simple as a lie. It's not catastrophic. It's subtle. It's a very, very subtle sin. My interest in um, the study of evil in human behavior comes out of my reading of uh, Scott Peck's People of the Lie, glimpses of the devil, and subsequent readings by other authors. I truly believe in my heart, my soul, that we are immersed in a culture where evil is an everyday influence and that we've somehow developed an immunity to being startled or repulsed by the evil that we deal with. Isn't that interesting that something that is a part of our own lives that we can't escape 
on every level, no matter how hard we try. We're influenced by it with our own thoughts and uh, the world around us. Yet we're so repulsed by it, we're not willing to be honest about our relationship to it. Well, it, this has personal meaning to me. It's very easy to present on television as Dr. McCarthy, retired clinical psychologist. But as you know, my past background led me through addiction, alcohol, and drugs. I need to prison sentence uh, for four years and a total change of life after that because of a uh, personal relationship with Jesus Christ. So how do we take this knowledge that you and I share and how do we reduce this to an invitation for people who are watching to challenge themselves and start to look at their own behaviors. Now I understand, I can't pull myself out of the pit. It's the grace of God. But that seems to me the second step. The first step has to come about when I look inside myself yes. and say, I'm repulsed by my choices. And I'm not sure that that can ultimately happen unless a person encounters ultimate good. Right. Uh, we, we can see some of the things that we, we do, the dishonesty, the little, we call them white lies, they're still lies. Right. Uh, we, can, we, we know that there's a better way to live, a better way to think, a better way to act. Uh, but until we encounter ultimate good, we won't ultimately see the evil within us. So are we, are we predestined then to always use contrast between ourselves and the actions of others, where we look down on, on others. It, are we predestined to live our lives where pride swells up and separates us from other humans? I think that's the case if we're unwilling to remove the facade of the lies that we've built up about who we project ourselves as being. Right. If we were honest with ourselves and we didn't rely on our persona of how we project ourselves to others, but we saw and, and dealt with who we truly are, uh, then we would want a way of escape. And, and that's interesting because that's another term for salvation. We, mm. would, we would want the escape. We would want to find a way out of this box that somehow we found ourselves in and we're not even sure that we built it. And in fact, by going back to the garden, we find that we did not build that box ourselves. We were born into it. Original sin. Original sin. So the, conceptually, what we're talking about makes sense from a psychological point of view as well as a theological point of view. I agree. This uh, topic of original sin or original evil entering into humanity at the very first couple, on that level, at that time period, permeates not only the, uh, the Bible, uh, the, all of the Bible deals with it, all the way from page one to page, the last page, but also not, not just the area of, the, of Mesopotamia and the ancient mm -hmm. lands there, but it goes all the way to China. It goes all the way around the world with all the ancient traditions in the first pages of the religious books around the world. That tells me this, Kevin, that we know the importance of the need for dealing with our own evil. Now, thank you, because you just set up the, um, where we're going in our conversation. Here's the plight that I have. I've been reaching out with the ministry, Dismas Project, across the country. We know that in the United States there are 65 million people who have criminal records. And we know what that means in terms of them finding good employment. We know that each of those 65 million people have at least two family members somehow in their family tree, all right, that are related and share the problems, uh, though they share the problems while they're living in their community. Whether the problem is shame, grief, uh, embarrassment, humiliation, they share the problem. Now, if you add 65 million and 130 million, that's two out of three Americans, but no one is talking about it. No one's talking about the shame. No one's talking about the grief. And certainly there is no specific outreach to people to motivate them 
to take the next step and say, I'm hurting and I need some help. I need some help to get through this valley. How do you see that? Uh, Dr. Bradshaw, years and years ago, <coughs> did some groundbreaking research and work on the topic of shame. Mm. And I think it's, it's that deep emotional uh, connection, recognition, pain that keeps people from wanting to talk about what they know is not separated from them, but is a very, very much a dear, a dear a endeared part of their own lives. Endeared not that they like it, but that it's a deep part of who they are. Uh, we are not separated. We are not separated from uh, a person who's been incarcerated, who is incarcerated, from the evil that we hear about on the, on the nightly news. We are not separated from that because it lives within all of us. How we deal with that on an inward level affects how we're going to ultimately deal with that on an external level. And it seems to me that the way we've dealt with it is to ignore it, isolate it. We'd love to separate ourselves from it, but what we find when we close our eyes at night is that it's very much a part of us. And we, we have to deal with it on that root level, I believe. Or we'll never, we'll never find the separation and the peace that comes from finding ultimate light, ultimate truth, uh, the, the God of all creation. So it seems to me that what we're talking about, the problem as far as reaching out to this group of people, this majority of people, is operationalizing forgiveness based on looking inside of ourselves, not looking inside them and what they've done, yes. but looking inside ourselves. The, uh, the Bible talks about, the Apostle Paul talks about running the race. He, he loves using mm -hmm. these athletic imageries. Right. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, we all run the race. The problem is we don't like to stay in our own lane. <laughs> and so we'd like to run the race for someone else right. instead of running the race in our own lane and dealing with our own stuff. I uh, had a contact recently at a local church, and when I first met with them as they wanted to set up a ministry to reach out to families of offenders, I asked them, I said, do you have a seating section for lepers? And they laughed. And I said, well, I said, if you don't have a seating section for lepers, I wouldn't be coming to this church. Because by social definition, having been an offender, I'm a social leper. How do we reach out like Jesus Christ reached out? I mean, he put his hand right on the leper and healed them. How do we model that? in our own personal behavior. You see, because it's not going to happen in church until we model it in our own lives. I totally agree. Uh, I don't think there should be a special seating for offenders or lepers because every person in there is a leper and an offender against God. Amen. And so, uh, you know, it's interesting that we classify those who have been um, imprisoned because they've offended something with the social laws of the state or the county or the, mm -hmm. or the government, federally. Uh, but what about those who've, who've broken the very laws of God that he says, when you've done that, you've been imprisoned yourself within a law or encapsulation of sin? So I see no difference. I see that every one of us are offenders. Every one of us have... Uh, have found ourselves in a prison that we cannot get out of without God's help. And hence the need for grace. The need for grace. The need Mercy. for grace. All right. uh, chesed is the term used throughout the scriptures for this mm -hmm. impassioned love of God that not only sees the plight we're in, but is willing to get down into it and mm -hmm. bear the load mm -hmm. himself and just asks us to follow him out. And it seems to me that the follow-on from that is the Great Commission, carrying the message of Jesus Christ to people who don't have a clue, have no hope at all, and breathing 
into them a sense of hope, a sense of confidence, planting seeds. I totally agree. And if if that good news does not completely and has as its source been inundated with the idea of mercy toward one another when we fall, when we make mistakes, it's not good news. Right. And, and it also is opposed to the good news of the Bible. The good news of the Bible says, no matter what you've been in, I'm going to help you right. by the grace of God get out of it. Right. Because we're brothers, because we're brothers and sisters together. So, your last statement personalizes our relationship with God. He's not some stellar, remote figure, but a force, a spirit who lives in us if we've professed our Christianity, accepted Jesus Christ, and helps us on a continuing basis. Wow. I think it's, it's putting God back into the character of who he truly is and not seeing him through the eyes, the filters of our own stuff. Mm -hmm. He's ultimate love. He's also ultimate justice. But because of that, his ultimate love, that balance, reached down from eternity past into the finite space of our history and died on the cross for us, shed his own blood, became sin for every person, murderers, rapists, anarchists, everyone, and says, come and follow me. Rick, it seems to me that one of the stumbling blocks for people in the Christian community to reach out to offenders is they expect repentance first. I understand that a person has to have a repentant spirit, but as an offender, how could I repent without being aware of God's forgiveness? See, Satan whispers in my ear and says, oh, what you've done is unforgivable. I need to hear the message of forgiveness before. I. Perhaps you see it differently. No, I see it the same. I see Paul writing letters to local congregations as they're trying to get a clue as well. They're instructional letters. And he says, you've been accepted into the beloved. Now, if they hadn't known that, if they, if they already knew that before, he wouldn't write that. Right. They didn't understand they were acceptable before God. Primarily, his audience was him reaching out to non-Jews in the first mm -hmm. century, those who didn't have a background of understanding God's love and his grace reaching out to them and saying, look, even though you weren't a part of the family, God is making you a part of the family. You are acceptable. To me, that's huge in its implications. Spiritually and psychologically, that, that acceptance seems to be the healing bomb, the healing salve that comes into a person's life. Look, Rick, um, we've only got a few minutes left on the show today. I'd like to invite you back next week, if you would, so we continue to explore this, because I think that there are literally thousands of people seeing this broadcast who have their own issues and don't know where to begin right. to grasp that healing, loving acceptance I'm not sure we really talk about it in our churches. I'm not sure that we show it to others that they have worth and that they have value and that they have dignity. And I think we all hunger for it. We need to know God's acceptance so that we can ultimately accept ourselves. It's only in that context that I can see a hope of change. I agree. I agree. And it's through the mercy and love of God that we realize he's already accepted us. Uh, come to where the water is pure. Come to where the light is pure light. Step out of the darkness. And God accepts us. He loves us. That's why he gave us. It's interesting then at, at the cripple who couldn't get into the pool. <laughs> Jesus said, do you want to be healed? He didn't ask him, did he want to get in the pool? He didn't ask him, do you want to get, do you want to be healed? And I think the Holy Spirit asked that same question to all of us. Because we can't get out of the pit we pull ourselves in. Can't do it.
It's got to be the grace of God lifting us out of that pit. And if the grace of God lifts me out of the pit and lifts you out of the pit, it can lift the worst offender and their family members out of the pit. Agreed. I, uh, I'm excited about this exploration because evil is not a pleasant topic. No. It's a hard thing to talk about. It's one of those hard sayings. Mm -hmm. but and, essential. And yet if we don't look at it and its impact on our own lives, there's no hope for us to effectively reach other people. And if I realize what Jesus Christ has done for me, in accepting his gift of salvation and redemption, yes. all right, and I see the hope of it, then I, need, I would have a burden. I would have a fire in my bones to reach out and to bless others in the same way as I've been blessed. Amen. Yeah. Rick, maybe you could uh, take a moment and um, just lead this out in a uh, closing prayer and any thoughts you might have. Okay, love to. God, we, we thank you so much for the grace that you've provided through the death of your son, the resurrection of his son, provides us with hope of a life to come. We thank you that you meet us right where we're at today, right here in the midst of our circumstances, situations, and that you are enough, you are sufficient, God. We thank you so much that you are the light in the midst of darkness. We give you praise and we thank you for all that you do for us even now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We want to invite you to join us again next Wednesday when we're going to continue to explore the gulf between good and evil, how it happens, how we fall into it to the darkness, and how we're strengthened to climb out through the grace of God. Please take the time to join us. And if you have questions, you have thoughts, I would encourage you to call the station and we will try and address those questions or thoughts as, um, as time permits. Again, I want to thank the management and the staff here at uh, KSCE TV for having offered us this opportunity to come into your homes and your offices and share with you today on a very, very timely and important topic. How does evil impact not just my life, the lives of my family members? Thank you for your time and your attention. It's great to have been with you today. Bye now. Thank you for watching United with Christ. We pray this has been a blessing to you and we invite you to tune in again tomorrow. We invite your comments, questions, or prayer requests. You may contact us at KSCE Christian Television, 2201 East Wyoming Avenue, El Paso, Texas, 79903, or call us at 915-532-8588 during regular business hours, or you can visit us on our website at www.kscee.com. God bless you.